Hi, my name is Pekka Laurel. I'm a co-founder of a company called IceEye. We are, uh, like, you know, just to, to put a bit of an intro and a background to, to, to what on earth are we working with, uh, the um, ecosystem is called New Space. And, and this is kind of as opposed to the traditional aerospace in a way that in the aerospace industry you have companies that build airliners, missiles, uh, national uh, large satellite missions, this type of stuff, Boeing, Airbus, this ec ecosystem. There is an ecosystem called New Space, uh, which uh, is around doing similar things, but in a lot more agile way, uh, out of essentially off-the-shelf components on the hardware side, uh, and building building kind of direct uh, end-user applications on, on, on the sort of downstream side. Meaning that like traditionally, then, these companies in the new space uh, would would kind of uh, go around the traditional structures of um, of of, of um, uh, this the space agencies or or things like this, uh, and then go kind of very direct to 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 the end users. And it usually, it's also a matter of integrating a lot of these different parts that that, that a service provider is ultimately also building their own hardware, just because it's more it's it's a more quick to to and more agile to to develop like this. Uh, and I guess you know something that I always want to point out, you know, when talking about space technology and then the new cool things happening in the private space sector, is is, is that uh, communication is an ob obvious thing. Earth observation, taking images of Earth, is an obvious thing. Uh, but you know, cool things like space tourism that that actually there's even a Finnish company doing. It's called called Space Nation, uh, and and then the mining from space, there's asteroid mining, which are you know just. Uh, things to point out to, to kind of uh, extend your imagination a bit to think of this type of an industry meaning that ultimately the resources of the world are not finite. Uh, and it's a, it's a very kind of a interesting thought to think about that what if the world economy isn't limited to the raw materials on Earth. And, uh, and there are companies working on this and that's, it's a really cool, cool field to be working on. And um, ISAI is a company uh, working in, the, um, in this new space sector and in building Earth observation, taking images of Earth, and now very specifically taking images of the Earth with a radar instrument. And uh, funnily enough, in a couple of years since we've spun out from the uh, Aalto University, we've actually become the world leader in this miniature uh, imaging radar technologies, actually by far, and it's, it's interesting and, and cool at the same time. Uh, we are right now employing around 50 people. We are uh, financed by, by a couple of uh, pretty big US VC funds. Uh, and then the sort of other normal European high-tech startup uh, that, that has Tegas funding, has European Commission funding uh, on, on top of that as well. And um, it's, a, you know, it, it's a usual combination, and, uh, but you know, it puts us in a sort of pretty strong position. Just this summer we announced uh, our kind of uh, Series A1 round, that was 13 million uh, of, of new venture capital to, to the company. So this puts, puts us in a position where we can actually launch our satellites in already multiples and kind of really scale up, scale up the business. Um, so this is about the background. Uh, really the um, I idea that we are building is really to be able to monitor the entire globe and monitor it quickly and reliably. Uh, and. Uh, this means that we will be launching a large number of, of these uh, radar imaging satellites. And now, what's cool about radar imaging is that radar imaging allows you to see in the dark. So you can see the very same uh, picture, whether it's day or night, because the sensor itself is sending its own radiation, and, and what you're ultimately imaging with is it's a sort of backscatter from the target. Uh, so, so this allows you to, to do imaging day and night, and then also, uh, from a satellite imaging perspective, it's very important that with a radar instrument, you can also see through clouds. So you can really build this uh, very reliable uh, data sets that, that are always there. And uh, this is important for some use cases. For some use cases, it's a bit less important. Uh, but but, but you know, the use cases that we are working with really are in the range of where you just really need to get that image every single time. Um, and now, this type of satellites have existed before. Um, and uh, now, the sort of unique angle that ISA is taking is that we've built this imaging radar sensor essentially 100-fold cheaper uh, and 
tenfold smaller, uh, meaning that we can launch these in this kind of massive constellations, which really the one thing it brings us is, is temporal resolution. So that what we can do is that we can be imaging day and night, literally day and night in a way that like we can take images with this constellation, let's say every two hours of a given site. And this allows us to build this kind of intraday data sets that you know, just simply haven't existed before that you can take images nighttime, you can take images in the morning, you can take images in the daytime, in the evening, and then back in the nighttime again and build these maps of activity that, that, that currently uh, the existing radar sensors uh, just cannot produce because they are taking images roughly, you know, uh, once a day at best. Um, and then, you know, the one other kind of um, slightly less intuitive uh, uh, outcome of, of operating a large constellation is that you're en ending up not having to make the compromise between what type of resolution and what type of area you're covering with uh, because you can end up mosaicing very large areas very quickly uh, with, with a large number of sensors. So, so then Here's an example of, of us being able to, you know, with this 20 satellite constellation, for instance, be able to uh, map the entire Baltic Sea in three meter resolution twice a day, uh, which is something that is, is, is way better than, than what currently exists. Um, and a few examples of how does radar images, uh, how, how do they look like? Um, uh, so here is a kind of a time composite of uh, this is Boasari Harbor. Uh, so you can see things that are moving uh, now in, in different colors. So there's basically just t three time instances, you know, o o overlap on, on top of each other. So you can see ships having arrived and left from the sea and the cranes having moved, the, the, uh, the, the shipping containers, uh, you know, kind of um, the yards filling and then emptying. And all of this is the type of human scale activity that really you want to be able to monitor in the sort of hour scale rather than uh, only every day at 12. Let's say you're monitoring a parking lot no, every day at 12, it's likely to be full. Uh, but you know, if you're imaging it every day at 6 a.m. every day, no, then it's likely to be empty every day. And then really for you to be able to build what's usually happening around this type of scenes, is this something that, that we are able to bring. Uh, and then this is another example. Yeah, I mean, Radar data is notoriously hard to show on projectors because you're relying on the uh, grayscale over here. But, but anyway, what you maybe see there uh, is these two trucks uh, in, in an oil terminal having arrived and left from, from, from the scene. So basically this is roughly the resolution that, that our, our final product will be from space as well. These are all from our aerial tests right now with, with our instrument in, in 12 kilometers altitude. Uh, but but um, building these time stacks going down to 3 meter resolution means that we can go ahead and actually detect changes down to individual cars. Uh, and then that's, that's really where a lot of the sort of interesting human scale activity happens. Uh, another example that what you can do with the radar, especially flying multiple sensors at the uh, kind of like in, in various kind of group configurations is, is, is doing um, uh, interferometry either across track or along track to, to find either moving targets or find uh, elevation maps of, 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 of scenes. Here's an example of, of us having imaged the same site from, from two different directions. Um, and then you get, get to build a bit of an elevation map out of it. Uh, and here's a, another kind of a time stack that is, this is no longer kind of like targets per se in the same sense, but it's, it's about classifying things that here you can see farms having uh, been, um, been harvested, where, where you can see a clear change between the, the, the brightness of these particular fields, but then most of the other things uh, end up staying the same. And then these are the type of, um, you know, when you think of deep learning and data sets, you know, ultimately it's really, you know, when you get the labels to this type of stuff, you know, then of course, you know, then you are clearly seeing now, I'm seeing here that, that, that there is a difference between the class of, 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 of this field over here and this field over here. And then to kind of figuring out what it actually means, is this then of course, you know, the, the, the other, part of, other part of the story as, as we've heard. Um, so ultimately, you know, our key uh, development so far has been really around, uh, uh, around developing a, an instrument that is so versatile that we can adapt it to a lot of different use cases, operating in a lot of different configurations to, to match all these kind of, um, you know, various use cases that really arise uh, from being able to take images uh, from the orbit anywhere on the globe in, in, in the sort of human timescales in, in matter of matter of hours. 
Uh, and uh, you know, just to show that it's real, uh, this is the first satellite that is being launched still this year. Uh, here it's uh, being baked out in a giant vacuum chamber uh, so that all the gases came out of it. Um, and, um, and then all of these satellites uh, will be operated from our fabulous command center in, in Otaniemi. Uh, so so um, uh, here we've already set up the, 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 the screens and then the processes. So, so, so um, when, when, when the launch is in December, then, then everything will work smoothly. And then this is the first one. And then of course, uh, then of course, you know, the, the things, things will continue from there. I guess to kind of, you know, wrap up, you know, what I was just trying to uh, describe out of the, the um, kind of positioning as, as to kind of, you know, where the business lies is, is, is that we have the traditional aerospace and then, and then we have the kind of new space uh, and, uh, and then the optical imaging, which cannot see through cars and can't see in the dark. Uh, and then, then, then we have the radar imaging on, on the top. So we are positioning ourselves into a space where right now there is an underserved market. And, uh, and then we are becoming the world leader in, in that. And uh, now what the new space also means is, is that nobody ultimately really wants satellites. Nobody ultimately really wants to see images just for the sake of seeing pretty images. Uh, but ultimately, people want to solve problems uh, with, with with this stuff. So so um so then, ISA is becoming, and a lot of other kind of new space companies as well are becoming kind of very very integrated vertically in, in a sense that a lot of our key IP right now lies in the sensor. We had to build that small radar sensor from scratch just because such a sensor just simply didn't exist before. Uh, so so that's you know, something that, you know, differentiates us from, from a lot of other companies. Uh, but at the same time, for us to get to the actual layer of business, it's about getting through building the satellites, operating them in a constellation, launching them, uh, and, and, then, and, and then building the data infrastructure to really deliver data to customers. And there, there is a segment of expert customers that really just want data. And, and then there's a way larger piece of a market that ultimately, you know, doesn't just simply doesn't know what to do with that data in order to get answers that, that, that they need and that's where we get get to the, the the part of kind of information services and that's obviously where the the the, um, the machine learning also lies uh, in, in this this whole equation um, a few words about the the um, kind of infrastructure that is needed to to, to provide uh, global satellite imaging uh, from from large constellations of, of satellites uh, in general um, if we're thinking of just the imaging part, uh, you know, the end user there being on the, on, on the left is, is accessing our system through either a GUI or, or an API and there is a, uh, there, there is a, a tasking system uh, and then, then, then uh, that tasking system then transfers into operations to operations to, to, to commands for the satellite to actually take an image then that command gets uplinked on the on, on, on a ground station when the ground, uh, satellite is on top of a ground station then the image gets taken on that particular geographical location that, that that the image needs to be taken at and then the data gets downlinked on the next uh, ground station pass and uh, the typical time frames for this are you know in, in order of the full orbit of a satellite is 90 minutes so the typical time frames are in the order of uh, you know 40 30 minutes uh, of, of, for, for this in the entire chain of events to happen uh, and we've built a GUI, uh, nothing spectacular, but, but uh, for a customer to be able to order images, you need to have it. Um, and uh, now then what's happening kind of, you know, behind the scenes then is that when you make a request for an image, you know, then somehow that request for an image needs to uh, translate into an actual acquisition by a satellite that has a certain orbit and, and at a certain time. So, so then uh, there's an, a bit of an optimization engine there to, 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 to provide you the, the, the passes that are actually possible. And then, and then we can either build a kind of mosaic out of those existing passes if they are smaller than the requested area or, or, or then just like provide a single picture. And then ultimately this turns into uh, kind of imaging angle and and then time that gets uplinked for for the satellite as a command to to take that image and then then then, then that image gets tied into the request. Um, and then when the data comes back, um, I mean, if I'm all honest, like n n a lot of this stuff doesn't necessarily exist uh, in 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 uh, in in this complexity uh, in 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 sort of operational form. Uh, but but basically, uh, this is an 
I mean, this is a description of how AR kind of, uh, I mean, now again, talking about big data in a sense that the individual image is, is, is already, or, or, or already, um, you know, tens of gigabytes in size. So, so then this very quickly builds up into a you know very large database. And uh, when you're working with geographical data, you know, a lot of the queries would be around, all right, give me a time stack of data over this particular location. So, so then the location becomes a very important uh, part of that query. And uh, and and then recently. Uh, pretty much, uh, I mean, in, in this type of uh, uh, this type of machine learning, everybody have been moving to the sort of NoSQL type of databases for this type of uh, uh, th this type of uh, you know binary matrix uh, bin binary matrix stuff. So so um, that's represented over here as one implementation, uh, and uh, and then if the images are delivered just as images, there's a format to that. And then, if they need to be delivered as as basically more of a sort of report that gets integrated into a customer system, uh, then 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 there is a you know separate process to that, uh, and, and then they then provide it over an API call as as a kind of a more of an answer than than, than an image. Um, and um, now I guess like you know this this is provides in a way sort of endless opportunities uh, of of which you know here's a few. Uh, and then these are quite traditional uh, end uses for satellite Earth observation, uh, uh, in in a, in a way. Uh, and then uh, some of these are. I mean, we are trying to focus on the ones that really benefit from the reliability and and and, and timeliness of, of of the data. And there certainly are uh, that type of use cases where where it really matters how quickly you're getting that data and how often you're getting that data. The name ISI actually comes from the the ice monitoring thing that we were doing with uh, with Arctic shipping and Arctic offshore to really uh, make sure that, that that the operations are safe and efficient, uh, so that the the the, the, the people operating there in the Arctic waters know where the ice is around them uh, and then there is you know literally no other infrastructure around them so so satellite imagery is is, is relatively uh, um, natural way to look at it but currently there just you know didn't exist a service that would be able to provide images hourly but you know the best for for them was you know being able to take images every other day which obviously isn't a very operational solution so then in that use case they ended up flying air, aircraft over the operations area and uh, and and then you know that's again a bit less safe and a bit less efficient money wise um, so now I wanted to uh, show you you know a, a, a bit of a more of a sort of practical and funny example of of, of how how the sort of a paradigm shift of, of you know Im employing deep learning in, in into earth observation data you know changes some things that that, that again go to the sort of um, uh, aerospace and then a new space uh, difference uh, and then it's it's around here in the maritime surveillance uh, domain um, so something that currently is 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 uh, being done quite a lot is, is is you know when you need to monitor your own waters your own economic zone your own fishing zone uh, f for safety or or for environmental reasons or or whichever reason really uh, or even your own fleet uh, uh, the 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 people are using the system called AIS which is uh, it's short for uh, automatic uh, identification system which requires all ships uh, of a certain size to have a uh, transmitter on board that uh, transmits on a sort of like in a sort of local horizon uh, their own own position uh, and then this original was meant for collision avoidance but right now it's being used a lot for kind of aggregating I mean this service you can go ahead and you know log on to a website and, and just see global all marine traffic uh, and then 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 they see where all ships are um, and uh, you know it's it's one very crucial and useful part of, of this kind of maritime uh, domain awareness picture. Uh, but now then, there's a thing that, of course, a ship would only be visible over there if it has this particular transponder on. And then which types of ships you know don't want to be seen are probably the ones that you would especially want to see. Uh, uh, so, so there's there's a there's a bit of a, a bit of a gap uh, in, in in the system. So, so then uh, this is where uh, using Earth observation and especially uh, radar from from space can can make a big difference. That first of all, 
a uh, like you know like the concept is that all right let's take uh, all the AIS detections let's overlay our radar picture and then let's see where in our radar picture there are ships that are not visible in in the in, in the AIS uh, detected ships um, so then the only problem is that's left is that okay now let's detect all ships from the the, the radar data um, and um, Sometimes it, it can be it can be a bit tricky to to to, to find uh, uh, find 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 ships from from radar data in a way that like um, ultimately radar the images are kind of images of backscatter in a way that like the the, the ground scatters uh, the the energy back you know waves scatter the energy back uh, and and then you're left with a black and white picture that you're supposed to you know make some sense out of uh, and and then there's a lot of um, kind of Differences that occur due to the environment in a way that, like here, you can see an example of the ground being kind of uh, brighter than the sea. And here, actually, the sea is already so rough due to winds that actually the sea is brighter than the land. So, 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 um, it, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, a bit less intuitive than than looking at optical pictures. But a lot of the sort of similar rules apply in in a sense that like. Uh, machine vision doesn't become necessarily very easy because you're dealing with a lot of changing factors and that uh, you would need to be able to kind of like work with a bit of a context as well because uh, otherwise you know the brightness of that pixel doesn't necessarily mean anything uh, um, and, and here's a sort of an example of, of what's being done right now that like in, in this case you know the ships are metal they have a lot of complex structure so they tend to in general be brighter than the water so so then uh, especially in high resolution, what you can do is, is that you can go ahead and make a sort of relatively simple uh, kind of a CFAR type of a detector uh, on very, you know, traditional machine vision uh, type of um, uh, type of rules. Uh, really, just kind of looking at the local contrast and 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 then, then seeing that okay, here seems to be something that is a ship-like object. Um, now, of course. Where the whole thing kind of breaks down is is that when your ship like object you know starts to be you know pretty much the same brightness as as this the sea or it even can inverse and and then you don't really know what's happening ha happening at all and this is especially true in the lower resolution when you know the the kind of a a resolution cell of a sea starts to be actually quite a lot larger and and then then the contribution of that ship starts to become less meaningful so so then everything kind of mixes up together uh, and um and this is something that, you know, it, it says ISI over here, and uh, and then this is basically a, a a traditional kind of ship detection probability model that has been provided to us by you know one of the the uh, traditional aerospace players that like guys, you simply cannot use your system to detect ships efficiently, especially in these low incidence angles and especially in these high winds, because can you now see that when we plug these numbers to our model? It, you know the, the ship would have to be hundreds of meters in size for for it to be detectable no well that's uh that actually you know the, the numbers are true the equation exists uh and then and, and you know like if you are looking at that basically kind of local contrast and and, and a pixel brightness no it is true uh now however like I, I think you can already see now where is a ship over there even if this isn't a very uh bright resolution uh, and uh, even if the ship itself is actually literally not visible at all, um, so so this is, you know, a very good example of, of where kind of suddenly everything changes when you're uh, uh, allowed to like you know pick a you know convolutional neural network, train for a feature, and and then and then you're starting to get detections. Um, so this is actually how. How how Gulf of Finland looks like on a on 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 a, on a nice weather. So so you can see all these ship wakes, and then these are like really really low resolution pictures. And then here uh, the, the the sea is actually quite quite bright. And then here's a sort of like even worse example where the 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 sea brightness kind of locally is varying really a lot. Uh, so that like you know if you would just now try to you know threshold anything, it would just all break apart. But still, the, the kind of features of, of that ship wake 
having have, having the characteristic of, of 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 a higher waves going in a triangle, and and then the the sort of a ship uh, engine leaving the sort of a, you know less wavy part in the middle, be being the darker part. It's something that you know if you can pick it up with a human eye, you can certainly train it, and um, and and then again, it becomes a question of the famous labeled data, and uh, and then we've done some work in collecting that labeled data, and uh, and of course you know right now since we are just launching our first satellite, uh, we you know cannot really have a a labeled database for for exactly our own sensor. This is from a uh, a, a kind of comparative sensor, and 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 then and then basically same. Um, same frequency band, similar incidence angles, uh, similar resolutions. So, so then, uh, so then, basically, you know, this is something that we did just to prove that, yeah, I mean, sure, it it can work, and then, and it it does work. And then, of course, you know, where the where where this kind of you know science part ends is is that 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 then, you know, it's kind of like um, you know we were able to get to you know pretty good percentages of of detection, uh, even in pretty tricky situations. But then again, like you know, this is where you know. Uh, you know, you can't really write a paper about it because it's not that we were there validating which one was a you know false positive, false negative, and uh, and and then and it's always obvious that if we had a larger data set, uh, you know, you would you would make the model better. But if you think that like we could get to say 90% efficient uh, accuracy in this type of a this type of an implementation for basically uh, all, all all operational use cases, you know, that 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 would be pretty much enough. And, uh, and and that's something that you know we see very feasible to do. Um, so that was a that was an example of, of of you know how 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 deep learning you know is is, is being utilized. And and then for us it's really funny from the point of view that like you know none none of us really had to be deep learning engineers in a way that we could go ahead and you know just basically get uh, get 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 ready uh, ready ImageNet winner models and then you know just you know try it out. From you know literally in a weekend and and then kind of prove that it works uh, and then that's really a sort of a, a uh, you know testament to to the sort of open source community and then this contest that that, that 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 we were able to do something where you know we had you know practically no training uh, prior, prior uh, and uh, and it, it seemed to work out fine and it obviously would work out a lot better if we had actual experts doing it but but here we are we're building satellites right now and uh, and then the data and and then you know we're happy to hire then 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 on the data side. Uh, here's a uh, here's just to kind of like put things in context. Uh, our first satellite is going up this year. Two two next ones are going up uh, spring next year. And then then the full 20 satellite constellation is being launched roughly in three blocks uh, over 19 and 20. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, we are hiring in pretty much any front you can imagine. Uh, and then then we are in Otaniemi, so so we're easy to. To, to to come by, uh, and um, and then also we are very happy to partner towards a lot of these use cases that like we know that it's not meaningful for us to go ahead and develop, especially domain knowledge, in all of these domains. So 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 that then the the end end, end use application uh, kind of analytics companies really could benefit from this type of data and then we definitely could create kind of joint products where where this type of uh, reliable and then very quickly updating data can really be the final piece of the puzzle and uh, you know create really unique things um, and I wanted to show here uh, kind of one last uh, treat uh, to 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 uh, maybe make you even more interested uh, we were thinking of, of, of like we, we do a lot of airborne testing uh, just because we are building a sensor from scratch and uh, it, it really needs to be tested quite a lot and it's really hard to test this type of a long range instrument in in a very short range lab uh, so 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 we fly with this uh, you know this is uh, this is a citation citation uh, jet and uh, it has a mini bar in in, in over here uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but but anyway so so um uh, we we fly a lot and then we collect a lot of data and uh, what we uh, were thinking to do is, is we kind of wanted to set up a, a, a bit of a sort of um, a, a kind of like data I, an, an analytics idea contest as well that, that we're uh, going to set up something that, that basically uh, would 
allow you to 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 basically come up with an idea of of okay so what's a thing that you know can be solved with a with a very high temporal resolution uh, earth observation data you know really coming down to sort of like tens of minutes in in, in refresh rates uh, and, and and then and then really kind of benefiting from the area of, of that being through clouds and also nighttime daytime uh, and and then uh, then, then with the best guys, we could then go and collect uh, collect the data set, and you would get uh, on, on on board the airplane and enjoy the minibar while we're flying. Um, and uh, then, then we could uh, you know work on a solution together. So this was my uh, speech tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>uh, how how you would uh, com uh, compare your your data quality with those multi-million instruments now in the space? Uh, I mean, do you have some estimates how this how how the quality of the of, of the imaging is compared with the with those state-of-the-art instruments already? Uh, yeah. So 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 uh, I mean, this is really kind of where we can scale by applying kind of physics in, in a way that like for, for us uh, the, the kind of airborne instrument tests really uh, give a very good indication of where the quality will, will, will fall just because the, the kind of signal to noise ratios goes to range to the fourth and, uh, and then the, the, the speed, uh, speed, speed, speed and kind of like this um, differences can then be scaled uh, and then the incidence angle differences can be scaled kind of by equations so so that really you know gets us to a point where we can pretty well say how we scale that to 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 the kind of assumed orbital quality and uh, and then the target has always been to basically be in there's a few i mean these are you know pretty you know uh, specific to the radar imaging but there are a few metrics uh that, that you know are are called a noise equivalent sigma zero and uh and uh, and then the ambiguity, ambiguity ratios and then we basically have you know tried to push those to match roughly the sort of similar strip map imaging modes that, that you see in either the TerraSRX or the Cosmos SkyMed that are the existing expand uh, Im imaging satellites so so uh, really from the sort of usability point of view uh we've tried to push to be in a sort of comparable quality category because we know that like, you know, if you are kind of below that, then, then it just simply doesn't make sense. Where we are making a lot of sacrifices is the, is the sort of instrument duty cycle that, that then if, if a large satellite would be able to take images, let's say 20% of the orbit, uh, we are actually able with our first satellites, you know, able to take roughly 1% per orbit um, uh, of, of an image. And this really just comes down to, you know, how much of a solar panel area you have and how big of an antenna you have so that, like, how efficiently can you transmit that power. So, so um, but then when you take that into the large constellation and the sort of kind of target the task collection, then it kind of turns out that, like, then the, if you're collecting higher temporal resolution for a single target area, then that, that one satellite would actually next time be able to image that area in the next 24 hours or something like this so there's actually ample time for charging if you're kind of positioning your your your, your target areas uh in a sort of efficient way can you give some some idea of the size of the data so you mentioned uh -huh. that one one percent of the orbit can be yeah. recorded and also what kind of parameters are there like when you give a command is it just 
the location or are there some other parameters that you are tuning? So how much data, what, what is the resolution, how many pixels, uh -huh. that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, so the resolution on, on ground for, for the sort of commercial system that, that we're, we're deploying is, is, is around three meters per pixel. Uh, and uh, then, then this makes, so, so the, the data really I mean, depends on the sort of compression, the very raw stuff that, that, that we get kind of like, uh, you know, pre-processed, you know, to the FPGAs is, is, is like, it's like uh, 450 megabytes per second. So, so that's, uh, that's a bit of a rough uh, data rate to, you know, try to even save, let alone transmit down on ground. Uh, but, but so then the final images, now if we're talking kind of like, you know, what's a single scene? Here was a, somewhere was an example. Um, here's, for instance, like, you know, examples of, of basically a single scene being roughly uh, this kind of block being like 40 by 40 kilometers or something like this. Uh, and then uh, where those would be in the sort of order of single gigabytes, uh, you would, because uh, right now we're operating, the first satellite operates on 50 megabits uh, downlink and, and there's only a certain amount of time when it's over the horizon, so we wanted to push it to be basically one image can be downlinked on a single pass and you know that ended up being 3.6 gigabytes sharp. So then we kind of squeezed the kind of the, the bit resolution, some packaging, uh, and, and then just the kind of image size resolution scale to, to kind of match that and that's currently our kind of a standard. Uh, but then that kind of like highlights the, the idea of like, you can always collect more data, uh, uh, but then you have to kind of system-wise have to have the ability to really get it through the whole chain. And right now the bottleneck is really in just the satellite to ground downlink because that's being done over radio and it actually, you know, there's a relatively narrow band that, that you're allowed to do that over. Uh, and it's also kind of a power question. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe that gives an idea. So, 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 so for for this kind of uh, what's that now? It's like two thousand square kilometers or something like this. Uh, would 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 then uh, give you around four gigabytes. So, so, and then and then, no, then of course when you take that into just a picture, of, no, then then it can be less. Uh, but yeah. <laughs>